want to thank everyone for joining us. This is, I believe, our fifth Coffee with Copi. Started this in the month of April during the COVID pandemic, and it's been a great kind of a Friday morning, afternoon uh, conversation among friends and acquaintances and even strangers. So we've really enjoyed how the how everything has progressed um, each week. We have a different guest speaker and um, kind of tried to just bring some positivity and uplifting discussion to the group. So Craig, you want to give a quick intro on Copiece and then we'll go from there? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about uh, interacting with Chris. So I'll be, I'll be quick on our side. Uh, a couple of things continue to move forward in, in what feels like a as positive way as possible. We are uh, interestingly going to be uh, attending the Berkshire Hathaway meeting on Saturday virtually. Uh, one, as, as many people know, Berkshire Hathaway is a holding company that kind of inspired Copiece in a lot of ways, um, like their holding company model, but didn't like what they're investing in. So um, looking forward to seeing what, uh, what they have to say. Uh, we are, have been getting more and more articles and research about how after the crisis is over, we've got an opportunity to you know, restart, redo, do things right. I think that I saw something you wrote about that, Chris, which I thought was outstanding. So looking forward to talking about that. But uh, yeah, we feel like, you know, we're in a good position uh, to take advantage of, of the restart and make our world a better place. Um, we are uh, going to get our co-piece marketing, Coma, going in earnest. We have a couple projects um, working with uh, Julian on some of them. And we've got some other couple things that are coming down that we'll be letting everybody know about. But uh, excited about adding another uh, portfolio company and then just wanted to appreciate our team. Our, our team has been, uh, uh, you know, hanging in there. We, we are already virtual. So um, it, it feels uh, like we were well positioned to be in where we are right now and appreciate Jim setting us up that way. Um, I have a lot of questions for you, Chris. So I, I'll, uh, I, I want to get to you pretty quickly. Uh, Thanks, Thanks, Ed and Hanan, do you have anything you want to add before we open it up to Chris? Uh, just uh, want to say uh, welcome again. It's great to see uh, returning faces coming back each week for this. It's something that we all really look forward to. And I'm very happy to have you uh, join us here for uh, a little bit of a respite from uh, what's a crazy world today. So uh, thank you mm -hmm. so much for being here. And uh, I'll stop talking so we can get to the uh, main event. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. Hanan, anything on your end? No, I'm good. I think, you know, uh, week by week saying no, we don't know what's going to happen. It, it's probably mm -hmm. getting old for the repeating people, but for the new people out there, we don't know what's going to happen. So mm -hmm. asking <laughs> you know, forecast on the economy, when is it going to get better? The answer is we don't know. We're seeing things open up. We're not sure how it's going to affect things. I think caution, cautiously moving forward with optimism is the best thing we can all do right now. And um, in, in every aspect of our lives, both personally, mentally, physically, and from the economical perspective on the investment side. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to hear Chris as well. So I'm going to be quiet here because I, <laughs> I, I can talk a lot. So uh, <laughs> if anybody has any questions about the economy later, we can get into that. But I think this Sounds is great. More of a, a different uh, approach. Thank you. Appreciate it. I am um, excited to introduce our guest today, Chris Starkis. He is um, in an eco entrepreneur, chef, beekeeper, and sustainable farmer. He's been featured in Star Chef magazine. He competed on Food Network's Chop. He was named one of Gen XYZ 2019 Most Influential Professionals by Colorado Biz Magazine. He recently did an interview with Conscious Millionaire Network, and it was named one of the top 13 podcasts by Inc. Magazine. He studied beekeeping at Oregon State. I had to throw that one in for you, Ken. Ken has uh, a <laughs> daughter at Oregon State. Um, and he is former, the former executive chef from, at Urban Farmer, uh, farm to table sustainable restaurant here in Denver. There's others across the country. And he recently left that position to start his new company, Boss to Frost. I'll let him uh, ex explain that to everyone and give a little more background on that transition. And finally, he and his wife and two kids um, farm a quarter of an acre next to their home in Lakewood, which is a suburb of Denver. So he's a, an incredibly well-respected uh, person in the sustainable farming community. And I'm excited to have you, Chris. I'm gonna turn it over to you and um, let you speak for a while and then we'll kind of just open it up for questions, so. Sure. 
Sure. Um, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, of course, but I think that we'll start with, you know, transition from being a chef for 25 years into uh, Boss to Frost. And uh, one of my partners is actually on the call as well. Mac Marsh is one of the inventors of Boss to Frost. And so, um, you know, I was a chef for a number of years and, you know, we had a lot of sustainability initiatives for doing the right thing, you know, environmental stewardship and water was a tough one when it came to uh, restaurants. And so, you know, I talk about all the time, you can do low flow faucets, things like that, but nothing's of significance. Um, and so um, those of you that are not in the industry, you may not know that uh, a lot of uh, defrosting happens um, in the sink and is actually um, one of the ways that is USDA mandated to defrost food um, and is honestly the most adopted because it is the quickest method if you need to get it done and quick. Um, and so essentially what that means is that you are putting a piece of food in a sink, you uh, say it's a steak or a turkey or whatnot, running water over it um, that cannot go above 70 degrees um, until that food is completely thawed. Um, and you generally cook it right away afterwards or not. And so um, USDA guidelines are basically saying it's about 125 uh, gallons of water per pound of food thawed. So you can say if you have a 15 pound uh, turkey, you can do the math there. And so what Bosti Frost does is recirculates that, that water um, over that product because it's really the agitation and the temperature that thaws it. Um, and so you can either use it in a sink or not in a sink. So you actually have the ability to free that real estate because it is a pretty uh, precious real estate in kitchens. Uh, kitchens are notori notoriously built as with as much space or not uh, as space, not a lot of space because they want to spend that um, that money in the front of the house. And so it's um, we're NSF certified. And um, essentially, when you start out with about 70 degree water, um, depending on what you're doing, you're using 98.5% less of that water. Um, we are, um, we came on market earlier this year and uh, we started in restaurants. We're currently in 14 states across the country um, and growing from there. And so that kind of rolls into what this conversation too, as far as uh, COVID is concerned. Um, you know, that market has, has slowed for us, obviously. So we are, you know, just as as chefs, restaurateurs, and things like that, and people in the industry, we have to pivot all the time, our strategies and what we're doing, what's working, what's not working. So I think, you know, this is not something that's new to me in terms of having to think and change um, and be agile. However, obviously on such a grand scale it is. Um, so we have started focusing on grocery stores, uh, schools, things like that. Um, we are working with uh, water districts across the country to um, work on rebates for commercial and residential use. So we've um, partnered with some um, like sustainable meat CSAs so that when you have frozen product in your freezer, you can thaw it at home. Um, and generally I can thaw a pound of food in about 45 minutes to an hour in my own sink using about two gallons of water. So um, that's the that's Boston Frost. I made that pivot because, um, you know, I've been doing this for a while and, you know, urban farmer like uh, Meg was talking about um, was sustainable and still is today. And, you know, I put those programs in place to not only do good in, in the world that, that I uh, that I felt as though we could with the facility that we had there. We had composting, you know, recycling. Uh, our diversion rates were up to 90 percent. Um, we had trash out only three days. Trash pickup was three days a week. Composting and recycling was five and six. We had all the data collection, everything on that. Um, and then when I saw the water piece come through with uh, uh, Boss Frost and we put that into place, um, I, I never personally myself wanted to chef own a restaurant, you know, with investors and things like that, that could be something that would be in the future. Um, but I wanted to do uh, equal entrepreneurship uh, for a while and just uh, know that I needed the right opportunity to, to jump into that. And so that's how Boss Frost came about. I met Mac um, actually online through Instagram and started working from there. Um, as far as uh, the farm, it's Lost Creek Micro Farm here in Lakewood. Um, my wife and I, we started farming, I would say about four or five years now. Um, and honestly, I did it because as a chef, I mean, I love growing different ingredients as well, but some of the ingredients that are a little esoteric and, and maybe not what you're gonna cook with at home, um, are the ones that you don't see out there. And when you do, they're either expensive or they're just in limited ability uh, or limited availability rather. 
And so we were able to start looking at catalogs and growing um, the, the types of ingredients that I wanted to use in the restaurant that really would put emphasis on, you know, growing for flavor and growing for just like some original flavors and original um, like heirloom seeds and things like that, that when you're talking about a local food scene that, you know, for instance, heirloom tomatoes aren't the best to um, put in boxes and travel, you know, many and long distances and actually get to you and they're and and be great. Now, technologies and whatnot have changed, have gotten better at that. But relatively speaking, as a chef, when you have something so flavorful in peak of season, there's not much you have to do with it at that point in time, except for show it off to a guest when they come in. And so uh, we started doing that and we were growing directly for the restaurant. Everything we had, we we would do some stuff locally here. Um, my kids would set up a uh, produce stand in the front. Um, we effectively called it like the new lemonade stand, if you will, since uh, that's what they had out front and teaching them, you know, uh, just about commerce and business and of course selling to people and engaging and, and they would run it on Thursdays. Um, but most of the other produce came to the restaurant um, and it kept me as a chef working um, in the seasons really and knowing, hey, I'm walking out in the field and seeing what's out there and what we can uh, utilize on the next menu or specials moving forward. Um, I've been beekeeping about the same amount of time uh, as well. And so I am in the master beekeeping program. I have since uh, I've finished my apprentice level. I'm in my journeyman level right now, which uh, should complete by the end of this year. It takes about two to three years to complete that section of it. Um, and then you're in the master side, which um, that's all through the Colorado State Beekeepers Association now. Um, so I'm going through that education as we speak. Um, we have uh, 14 chickens here, uh, a couple of hives, and a quarter acre, uh, like, like uh, Meg talked about, to grow on as well. Um, I don't know, I guess I'll start with, you know, kind of the, the article that Craig was talking about. I wrote for um, Artistic Fuel, just came out a couple of days ago, talking about recreating um, the restaurants to basically be a, a more sustainable option and being more environmental leaders. You know, I think that this is the opportunity to look at all the weaknesses that uh, the restaurant industry has been built on um, and really strengthen that. And, you know, it took me a while just to think about, you know, the spectrum of what restaurants and food service is, is so large. Um, and so, you know, as I talked, to, as I thought about it, I was like, you know, I don't, I don't believe that, I know this affects the whole restaurant industry, but I believe it affected them all in different ways. For instance, you know, the Thai and pho place around the corner that was built on basically Grubhub and those types of to-go, you know, you're not sitting in their dining rooms all the time. You're not going for an experience. You're going for great food, maybe cheap food, and, you know, just so you don't have to cook that night or you're hungry or whatever that may be. Now, in terms of restaurants like Urban Farmer that are, for, that are full service, you know, that's a different, that's a different avenue. You know, they um, actually announced today they're opening up for to-go business, which is great. I think, you know, in my opinion, they're doing that to kind of keep the PPP in there and people employed and kind of seeing what's going on. But it's not a sustainable model for running a restaurant, especially of that caliber. You know, I, I like to believe that that was, you know, that style of dining is about the experience, the engagement, bringing people out, um, understanding the ambiance um, with your staff, the chef that's there, what are they creating, seasonality, and really enjoying that as a whole round experience. And that's not what, you know, a to-go food, it's not to say you can't get great food, but that's not essentially what I know I got in this business to do. And I think a lot of other chefs, a lot, I've read a lot of great articles, New York Times this past Sunday as well, with a chef, um, a prune that closed her restaurant and kind of spoke to what the future of some of these restaurants may be as far as food service. But I think really looking back and seeing how much are we going to continue to be supported by guests out there and exactly where do we need that support to go? Um, I mentioned in that article that, you know, providing a living wage is a difficult thing. You know, most people think that um, food is supposed to be cheap, affordable all the time. And the people that are doing it is cheap labor. Now there's again, a big spectrum on that. However, um, it's going to rely on, on people understanding the, the quality of the food that they have and wanting to pay for that food for what it costs to produce. And so it kind of goes all down the same line. It's a similar thought of uh, kind of what fair trade has out there as far as like coffee and chocolate and things like that. You know, it's not all completely aligned parallel, but um, based on that notion, you know, I, I also mentioned in there that there's a number of cooks that would come to me and basically looking for two, three more dollars an hour 
um, and would rather go drive Lyft because it was actually a little bit more, you know, a little bit more lucrative for them. They could work the hours they wanted to. They could decide when they wanted to work. And that was kind of what we were up against. And so I kind of see it as no other way to um, I, I, those type, again, it's restaurants like Urban Farm are moving forward. You, I think you're going to have to put sustainable plans into measure, you know, things like Boston Frost saving you on your utility bills, you know, paying fair wages so that people want to work every single day because it's not an easy business to be into. Um, but just like farmers, I think that um, there needs to be a, the right incentive there. And that doesn't necessarily mean, um, uh, what do you call it, um, subsidizing. You know, I don't think that's it. I think it just needs to be a place where people can come in and know they can make a living as well as know that when they get older um, that they can actually retire and, and kind of be done with it and know that they can train the next generation up. So that in a nutshell is kind of what my feelings of, of the industry and what's going on, especially for farmers and, and, and sustainability. Um, I think a lot of this, like you said, you guys have questions too. I think I'd like to open it up to that and just say thank you for the, you know, inviting me and, and I'm, I look forward to the questions. I, it's always great. I always learn something too. Great. Thanks, Chris. Really great summary, and we're excited to have you. I'm, um, I'll open it up to questions. You can just jump in or raise your hand on the Zoom, whichever. I have a question. It, Go it, for it, Kanan. And I'm sorry for the randomness of the question. I'm, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. But um, we're seeing a huge, it, it, I think it goes with the sensitivity, but we're seeing a huge move to the meat list. Um, uh, you know, kind of with beyond me, what I would love to hear kind of your thoughts on it from an, from an industry insider. Um, you know, obviously it's a big deal and with game changers, you know, and then kind of getting a lot in the media. So just would love to hear your thoughts about that and the, and the think, actual um, sustainability of that. Right. Aspect. And how it, how it relates to water as well. Yeah. Uh, those yeah. Things. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough one. Cause I think just like, um, I think just like you see in restaurants, there's people doing it right and there's people not doing it right. I think that, um, you know, what I actually tried a, about a year and a half ago for Urban Farmer to take the steakhouse quote unquote moniker off the restaurant so that it was just Urban Farmer so that we could actually pivot away from just steaks as a center cut. I think it's going to be something that's going to become a dinosaur and expensive. Now, I don't necessarily believe that Beyond Meats and things like that are going to replace that in the next 10 years, I think it'll replace and be on menus. Um, in the time that um, I've been here in Denver and ran the restaurant, you know, we made sure that we had a spectrum of vegan, vegetarian, steak centric, you know, all these things. So we had a spectrum of, of menu items on our menu, which would include Beyond Meat moving forward, because my feeling always was there's so many restaurants out there. And if you're going to treat people as if like, hey, we're a steakhouse, why'd you come here as a vegan? What's wrong with you? That's not a model that you're going to work on. As a chef and a culinarian, it's about you getting excited about the challenge of creating those dishes, right? And so if I know that, say, we're all out of business, we're all at a business function, there's eight of us going out to dinner, there's one vegan and I want meat, the vegan's going to win on where they're going to go. And so at the end of the day, it's like, hey, or they're going to sit down at the restaurant and be completely not happy with just a bowl of steamed vegetables because there was no thought from that restaurant or that culinary team for that person and what their dietary distinctions are. So I think you're going to see it integrated into a lot of menus. I mean, obviously, I can't tell the future. I think at the end of the day, it, it may take over. But I also know that I've worked with many ranchers, small ranchers, again, like farmers, um, that are actually doing it right, you know, and, and so... You know, a good friend of mine, Boot Hill 7, is up in um, um, Wyoming, in Lusk, Wyoming. They have a, a couple thousand head of cattle, and, and they're doing it the laborious old school way, you know. And so that's not, you know, they, his family's been doing ranching there for 102 years. And so it's kind of ingrained in their culture how they do it. And, and I've seen them do it well and sustainably, you know, speaking to what Craig was saying as far as water, you know. They have wells and they have laws in place that you can only have so many head of cattle per that acreage, and it's not a feedlot. You know, he ha he finishes it. He finishes all his own beef there and brings it to a butcher. So I think there's room for those sectors to grow and doing it right. Um, and I just think that just like anything in the restaurant, it needs to be supported and understood by the guest because then they're going to want to pay the difference and understand what the difference is to really change um, what's brought to the table. 
I have a, I have a question. Um, Go ahead, Dan. Um, moving here from Wisconsin, living on Lake Michigan, the preservation of water seemed to be a non-issue. Seemed to be. <laughs> now moving to Colorado, we find that uh, that's obviously not the case anywhere. I'm, and I don't mean if this facetiously, but all of us are washing our hands dozens of times more frequently than we did. I think that's safe to say. Is there is there an effective way, efficient way of of uh, preserving water and still being uh, responsible in terms of hand washing? I mean, absolutely. I think obviously you've seen a spike with that with COVID, and we should be washing our hands anyways. It's something that we do um, in the industry all the time now. You know, I look at conservation and preservation, obviously. Preservation being the not use of something and conservation being the wise use of something. So I think that moving forward, conservation of water as being a priority, um, again, it goes all out to the education of what people are gonna care about. You saw very quickly that when um, we didn't have any TP, how much people cared about it, right? So <laughs> I think that, you know, um, I think that if we put a priority on what, water use moving forward is I was I was in Vegas for 15 years okay I, I grew I, I didn't grow up there I went to community college out there culinary school and and worked out there a lot and I saw and that's actually one of the first partners that we're going to partner with with Boston Frost is the Southern Nevada Water Authority because they've gotten a lot of stuff right with what's out there I mean the real the reality is because they put a lot of these things in place we signed a contract when we owned our house down there to change our landscape to xeroscape and part of that contract was once you did that in perpetuity, that can no, not be changed back to a lawn or anything from there. And so I think it's gonna take a layered approach, but it needs to be prioritized not only by its citizens, but also by the policymakers. And, and that is when I truly think that you're gonna see that conservation moving forward, because I don't believe that there's, we can't go to zero obviously, right? So I think that I think that there can be. I just think that there needs to be a lot of support and a lot of attention to the water issue. Um, and I know that we're seeing it in our own in our own side of things for Bostifrost is that, you know, it, it it in itself saves water, time, and money. Now each person I bring that to is wanting it to do one of the things better than the other. You know, there might be a person that hey man, water's cheap, it's eight cents a gallon in my restaurant, you're not gonna save me a lot of water, why should I conserve water, right? And at that point in time, it's an, event, it's an environmental issue and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, prove you otherwise, you know, but I can tell you it's gonna save you time and figure out the algorithms and money there and then it's actually worth your time um, in the way that you see it in your view. So um, I think that that's really what needs to happen moving forward, if, I don't, if that really, I think I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Can I throw a question at you? <clears throat> um, so I think that this whole uh, pandemic has just proven how global we've become and that these sort of chains of supply chains of food come from all over the world and can have effects that we don't think about for months down the road because of that supply chain. Um, I was wondering if you have any knowledge around just like vertical farming and farming like in a small local space, you know, to, to supply these urban dense areas with food that isn't having to be shipped from the other side of the world. Um, or just even if you have an opinion around that. Yeah, it, thanks, Jim. I absolutely do. So that was one of my things was, you know, we worked with, um, so arable land being soil, um, you know, and then there's of course vertical growing, which is hydroponic and aquaponic. So aquaponic being with fish and hydroponic being with just water, right? So there's ways to do it. And I think that there's, out, there's people out there doing it right. But then you're looking at what does the energy actually take to do that? And you're kind of, that you're waiting for the technology to really take it over. Now, I haven't seen people doing hydroponic or, or aquaponic in that way that you're actually growing crops that are going to sustain it. Anytime you see anything um, advertised for that, it's always lettuce. You're not going to sustain the world on lettuce. And so I think, again, like we talked about water, putting arable land um, as a priority as being part of a city makeup and not pushing all the farms and everything on the outside is going to incentivize people to do it. Um, a good friend of mine was called Rebel Farms downtown. They do hydroponic. They do a lot of lettuces and we used to buy from them. Now, the only reason that they were downtown and that they didn't have to drive all the way was because their warehouse was too close to a school for a marijuana grower to take it over. 
and why that the actual rent was affordable for them to actually put that type of model on there. And so that I think was just a niche in the system because if it was marijuana, it would have been that. And so I think as if as policymakers, we put priority on these local food systems and incentivize people that want to do the hard work. Because let's be honest, there's a lot of young people coming out that don't want to work hard. They want to create an app, make millions, go drive Lyft and work whenever they want. Um, farming isn't that way. Um, you know, I, 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 I can tell you that 100%. Sometimes I got to get up and take care of some things. I didn't really feel like doing it that day. But at the end of the day, um, I, need, I need to get up and, and, and do it. And I'm working for people to be able to drive up, pick up their CSA, and then move on with their life. Um, I, I did toy with um, menus that actually would put the time it took to actually, you know, instead of like the uh, nutritional value of the food, but actually under that entree, showing the total time it took to grow it. Um, for instance, you know, I mean, my tomatoes, you know, I'll plant those in February and then start harvesting in July. You know, that whole period of time, I'm not getting anything off that tomato. And so um, I digress a little bit, but I think that at the end of the day, yes, I do believe it, but again, it has to be in policy for actually to change. You can only have so many passionate people out there um, with their arms in the air trying to make it happen. Um, and, and I think that's why we, we definitely farm here um, at my house is that this house was built in 42. Um, it came with a well, so we have a well that we're able to water with, so therefore it's financially viable. Um, to actually grow and then move from there. Otherwise, doing it with city water wouldn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Very good. I think Steve hey, Williams Chris. had a question. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Hey, Chris, can you hear me, Chris? Absolutely. Hey, Chris, um, what just happened with the food? I, uh, a year ago, they were talking about dairy farmers and farmers having the highest rate of suicide because they weren't able to produce food. Now we see the destruction of all this food. What just happened? Well, you have to remember, like a lot of, depending on what it is, you have a lot of people that are subsidized by the government, right? And so what's happening is that at least in the, in, in the moment that there is right now, if monocropping has become a thing that has been difficult for farmers, obviously you want to count on all your onions, you know, you can grow it and then that's it. So if all I have is a crop of onions that I need to move from New York all the way to California um, and no trucker to do it, then, you know, the local food scene and food banks are only going to use up so much. And at the end of the day, once they hit that peak, um, they're going to go bad. And you're either going to plow it back into your field like you saw, because that's all you can, because you're working at how you're succession planning, for instance, in this example, those onions, for them to come up as people need them. Now, onions in this respect are something that you can box and, and will put up for a while. But if you're talking about, you know, green onions or, you know, even tomatoes and things like that, um, that's going to be difficult to move and there's going to be a point there where they get overripe and aren't, aren't good for anything except for like chicken or pig food. So um, I think there's a big spectrum of what you were talking about there, but I feel like, um, you know, when you're talking about farmers like myself, it's something that we do. We have a CSA model and we're passionate about it. We're not subsidized or have grants or anything like that. When you have a whole crop of thousands and thousands of acres of wheat or barley or something like that, that's all you got. Um, and so you got to make that work. And sometimes when those subsidize or insurance and things like that, um, I think that's part of why the model needs to change to, um, to what we were talking about earlier in terms of having more urban farms and building that community. Um, but again, it needs to be incentivized, right? So somebody actually wants to do it. Thank you. Uh, Brendan had a question. Hey, um, you might have answered this, and I apologize if you did. I had to step off and pick something, but um, I was just thinking uh, some of the people I know, there's like a app um, in, from a local Denver company called Plastic Score that basically uh, scores how much plastic a restaurant uses. So I guess I was just wondering from, from my side, the consumer side, uh, you know, I would prefer to go to a restaurant that uses your system, the Boss Defrost, but how do I, how do I differentiate, you know, what restaurants are using it, what restaurants aren't? Like, I guess I'm asking kind of who are, you know, like your power partners or people that can sure. help advertise that for you. Sure. Um, the best one that I know of right now is called the Good Food 100 list. Um, Good Food 100 list started in Boulder. Um, you can look them up. They are nationwide and essentially um, we were part of it at Urban Farmer. We were in our third year. Um, they're rated anywhere between one to six stars as far as their, um, 
their sustainability model and kind of where they're getting their food. It's based off of uh, where you're getting your food and where you're spending your money. Because again, a restaurant like Urban Farm on the outside, you're like, wow, they're getting all their stuff. This is farm to table. How awesome is that? And then when you actually look at where they're getting everything, that's not necessarily the case. Now, it's a transparency model. Um, I filled out, it was like a 32 page application telling them what companies I worked with, who are my reps, so that they could call them, actually look at our invoices and see how we're spending our money as if we're saying how we're spending our money. And so um, we're working on partnering with them with Basta Frost because they're slowly adding a sustainability side to that um, list because right now it is all very much food based and they put an emphasis on. Um, certified organic food so therefore if you're doing certified organic uh, locally um, you're gonna have six stars um, I know that last year we came in at four stars out of six um, but I know I could have changed that right away in terms of you know again we're talking about the business model here as well I couldn't make the decision uh, viably to change over from natural eggs to what's called you know certified organic it would have doubled my egg prices on what my um, brunch and uh, breakfast would have been so I could have improved my score on Good Food 100, but probably not my score with the CEO of the company I was working for. So there's decisions that we need to make that are kind of down that middle road. But as far as you as a consumer, um, Good Food 100 is the best one out there that I know of that is actually, again, across the United States um, and doing the right thing. And that, again, is actually asking you and you have to show and prove what your worth is there. Um, the plastic score, I met those guys at a recent uh, summit um, before they launched. They're, I asked them how they were doing it. They were going from a model of guest reporting, um, which is almost like a little bit like Yelp and coming from the restaurant side, it's almost like yep. people coming uninformed into what they're seeing. Now, obviously you can tell if someone has styrofoam and then they're saying they're this farm table sustainable restaurant, that's a pretty blank call out. But I think that when you're talking about changing the industry to more sustainably, it's gonna take um, these leaders in these restaurants to slowly do it. I mean, there's we did it over a two-year period of time and i was lucky to start out with a lot of the initiatives that we had when we opened up because that was a priority of mine um, but when you're up and running um, there's only one way to kind of slowly do that and make decisions on what your inventory is um, i like the idea that they have um, i just wish they were going from it from the restaurant tour side so that people would participate and then i think the data would be a lot better than than probably what they're getting at least to start Yep. Well, thanks, Chris. And we put, we posted that link in the chat for anyone that is curious. Um, we have a question from Joanne out in the Bay Area. Hi there, Chris. Um, question for you, and actually uh, the prior question was a great segue to it. We've seen a massive rise in allergies and sensitivities, food sensitivities. Um, I, I'm one of those many people who suffers from some pretty serious food sensitivities and allergies. Um, what do you what are you doing and how do you think the sustainable food movement and organic food movement is contributing and or helping to prevent the continuation of this pattern? You mean people actually being susceptible to being to allergies, things like that? Yeah, yeah. and I've, I mean, I've traveled, traveled all over the world, India, Africa, you know, South America and, and see far lower rates of the sensitivities. And I'm, I'm always in awe when I watch people just sitting there eating peanuts or, you know, shellfish or things that I can't eat. And I wonder what their secret is. So I'm wondering if you have some perspective on that, given your knowledge of food and origins. Um, I would say that as far as data is concerned, like the, if any of you have read the book, excuse me, Wheat Belly, he speaks a little bit about that when in terms of you know, these non-GMO wheats and wheats that are actually natural and ancient that are actually growing regeneratively, not affecting people that have these allergies. Now, I do believe there's a, a percentage of people that are just going to have these allergies. And from a restaurant perspective, you know, there's certain things that we can claim and not claim. I mean, I can't claim that I'm a gluten-free um, environment, but I can claim that I'm going to do my best to make sure that you don't get sick, especially, right? Um, and that trust is built between the restaurant and the guest. What we did a lot of the times was, for instance, you know, I had the ability to say, hey, we don't use peanut oil. We didn't use soybean oil as well. We used, um, uh, what is it, not in my way. Uh, sorry, canola, that's it. We used canola oil um, because that was the blend that we could use with a company that we were working with called RTI. Now, 
The tough part about that is if you're an authentic Asian restaurant, you want to use peanut oil because that's what they cook with. So are you giving up a little bit of your authenticity to make sure that people aren't allergic to them? So um, I think that if you're getting away from what's, you know, for lack of a better term, not mass produced, but, you know, those GMOs and, and whatnot that are um, engineered that way, um, I think you're going to see lower rates of it. Um, but I also think that, you know, as, as you probably know, that some of it has to do with just that you're, you're born that way. It's in your genes and you might be allergic to something. I had a, I had a, um, a friend of mine, a uh, chef friend of mine that, uh, he's, uh, we worked with for, for years, Filipino guy, and he was allergic to shellfish. So I don't know how he made it past like two years old without his, the culture of his family killing him. I don't know how, it, how that happened, but he was like, yeah, I'm allergic to shellfish and he always has been, and he just watches it, you know? That's helpful. And I, I would also add on um, your comment about, you know, vegans and, and all of that. There are those of us who have allergies, we work to accommodate ourselves. And I certainly don't put it on restaurants to look mm -hmm. out for me. I do think it's my responsibility. Um, but I always appreciate when restaurants are forthcoming with what the ingredients are and are, are open about it. But um, certainly hope that the world doesn't continue to try to put that responsibility on the restaurateurs or on the chefs because we know ourselves better than anybody else. And that's important to take that personal responsibility. Agree, I agree with that. And I think the responsibility too is just on communication. Cause I know that from our side, hey, give us a heads up, let us know you're coming in. We'd love to make something special for you. That's what we do, we're hospitable. We wanna make sure that you have just as good as a time, at, you know, being vegan and vegetarian in our restaurant as someone who just loves sitting down at a 20 ounce ribeye, right? And so that's, that to us is on our side. It's also for us to keep up to date on exactly what the idiosyncrasies of some of these uh, distinctions are. In addition to you kind of communicating that too to, to server and staff, because then it helps us again, make sure that your experience is as most pleasurable as possible. But I think it, it's a 50-50 though. I do appreciate someone like yourself coming in and really taking that ownership, but unfortunately not everybody's like that. So we on our side have to put out as much communication as we can um, without being too, um, too communicative. You can't just create special menus for that all the time. Your staff needs to know what's in stuff so they can help sell um, those, those dishes to people that have those distinctions. Very good. I think we'll take a, another question or two and then wrap up. Anybody else want to jump in? Don't be shy. I know you there, got a question, Paul. Is there a pasta for us for personal use? The same model that we have now is for personal use and for commercial use. So um, it's, you can, bossafrost.com is our website. I've been using it at home for residential use for thawing. Um, and it is the same one that we have that's built for professional kitchens that is NSF certified. It's uh, about $300 plus shipping. Um, and then that's it. So it, I used it in a professional kitchen for over two years. Um, Urban Farmer actually bought a second one after I left. Um, and it just, you know, I, again, for people out there that are, are specific about their proteins and freezing stuff like hunters and whatnot, um, that's a huge thing. You probably have a freezer full of, of meat. Um, you know, even now during, um, during all this pandemic, it's like my wife and I get to four o'clock and we're like, what are we having for dinner? You know, in an hour and a half or whatever it is, <laughs> kids are going to be hungry. I have two kids. So, um, you know, it's, they, they don't wait as long as, uh, you know, maybe an adult would or just eat ruffled chips or something like that because you forgot to put a, you know, take out meat. So um, it's the same model. You can see it online um, right now. Um, and yeah, it's definitely good for residential and uh, commercial use. Awesome. Thanks. Great. Any other questions? No. I have a question. Um, Go for it. Chris, I really liked all of your answers. I really appreciate it. I think I'll align align very well with your opinions so that's cool um and you you're all across the whole spectrum which is cool to see um i'm curious more about your farm and my specific question is about the produce safety act and i'm curious what your th thoughts are on that because i know that's kind of coming down the pipeline starting with larger farms and coming down uh, i think eventually to farms that are even at your scale and i'm curious what problems you foresee if any and how you're going to deal with that if you're talking about needing to be certified for the government to sell is that what you're talking about pretty much yeah. yeah and so my issue with that is yes we're a quarter acre farm there's not anything that we need to do in terms of have 
any, we have insurance. If for instance, if I need to sell to the restaurant, we have insurance to sell the restaurant because whatever entity we're selling to requires that. So uh, my wife worked for Whole Foods for a while. I know at the time, which was, uh, was probably seven years ago, you needed at least a million dollars of insurance to sell to Whole Foods for that, that reason, right? But I think if you're practicing, um, you know, sustainable, natural, regenerative farming in that way and not using pesticides, um, my worry with that moving forward in terms of having quote unquote food safety is that it'll be similar to the certified organic model. And what happens to that is that it's cost so much money to become certified organic because it was monetized that some farmers are basically saying, um, uh, I, I don't know if it was just an organ or if it's federal, but it was what was called a transitional farm, which meant you were doing everything organic to get to that organic uh, certification because you would need to be you know, operating for five, 10 years or whatever it was prior to becoming certified organic. Um, but again, like we talked about that, the cost of, of doing that sometimes, not only the operations, but all the certifications that happen to become that, um, when you can kind of do that on your own without the government oversight. Um, so I guess for me, I wouldn't support that 100%. Now I can see where they're coming from in terms of like the romaine recalls and whatnot. And I think for someone that's truly that large, that has an operation that is just romaine, i.e. down in an Arizona area, and of course, uh, like Salinas, I think was where the first one was from, um, then yeah, I do believe that maybe there needs to be some oversight there. But I, I can't imagine that, again, a quarter acre farm like myself who operates five months out of the year needing to pay for like some safety quality insurance that way. I don't know, I think there's, I think there's a little bit of gray area there, um, but I could see room for what you're talking about on maybe on a larger scale because of um, maybe some of those industry specific ingredients. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thanks everybody. Uh, really, really uh, enjoyed today's coffee with Co-Peace. Uh, Meg, continue to appreciate your idea. Uh, we've got a couple other plan, you know, planned in the pipeline for throughout this month. So uh, I think that our current plan is to do it through the end of the May and then, uh, and then uh, let everybody rest from the coffee for a little while. But uh, Chris, your, your, your story is, is such, so compatible and consistent with what we're trying to do here at Co-Peace. I, I think, you know, paying people a fair wage so that they get good food is such a important message. I think, it, you know, we feel like, you know, we're trying to democratize access to building equity for communities that have not had access. And I think um, a big part of that is education. So uh, it feels like, you know, one of your biggest challenges is going to be communicating this, this fairness to people, you know, good, good food at a, at a fair price. And, and I just feel like, you know, a, a, a lot, a lot of people would, would support that movement. So we're looking forward to continue our, our conversation and, and getting to know more about the uh, Boston Frost, but thank you so much for today. Uh, Meg, anything else to wind us up? No, I wish everyone good health, stay safe, have a great weekend, and we hope to see you same time, same place next Friday. So thanks, everybody. Yeah. Well, thank thanks you, guys. Everybody. Have a yeah. great day. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, Appreciate it. Bye.